Afternoon. It is March 16th, uh, just past the Ides of March. Scary time for all of us, no doubt. And uh, it's THCB Gang. I'm Matthew Holt, the host, founder of THCB, and uh, uh, at Baltimore on the Twitters with me, a great lineup, which actually is the same lineup. And I'm still having this weird video thing that's happening to me on Zoom. I will have to sell my stock, although that's two years too late. Um, same lineup should be had about six weeks ago, uh, which is, I call it, the, 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 the only line of the old men older than me. And there aren't many of those left. <laughs> anyway, uh, Ian Morrison. Uh, uh, Vaunted Health Futurist, Mike McGee, medical historian, Michael Millison, patient safety expert from Health Quality Advisors, and Vince Karadis, uh, consultant and platform analyst and expert. All right. Uh, hi, gents. How are we? Hope we're all doing fine and well. I apologize if I flash in and out of this weird hey, thing. Respect, I respect your elders. <laughs> yeah. I, I have lots of respect for my elders, um, especially as, I, as, as most people I deal with in my everyday life now. You know, I, I was on a call the other day. Uh, uh, a friend of mine, you know, a, a former Health 2.0 CEO is now doing something and she's going to be um, well, I'm not sure I can talk about what it is yet, but it's going to be this weird uh, experience of, of, of sort of broadcasting from a very remote place with a bunch of famous people involved. And I was on this call and I realized when I got on the call that the gray beard, I was at least 30 years old than anybody else on the call. Going, oh, dear. Probably probably time to like retire into some beach somewhere. But anyway, but I'm pretty much where you are. Anyway. All right. Let's uh, kick it off. Uh, it's been a uh, it's been another 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 week of interesting stuff going on in the world uh anyone who lives around where i did was uh, spent most of the weekend over complete panic that the economy was ending and then by monday morning it was all right again so uh, <laughs> that may come up but there's been other stuff some happening so uh, ian why don't i start with you yeah well i'm i'm a first Re republic bank customer so been watching that one yeah for sure um no i was in orlando uh, about 10 days ago with 150 hospital CEOs. So I got lots of stories from the road from, from that crowd. But my highlight was um, past the Walgreens and uh, when we we're driving around and in in uh, Walgreens, as you know, just acquired what Village MD, City MD and Summit. And uh, the, the Walgreens we passed in Orlando had uh, emblazoned on the side wines and spirits. Uh, because I guess it's legal to sell wines and spirits in a drugstore in Florida. And uh, I, to me, I just laugh because it, it seemed to be the, the Glasgow dream, uh, you know, for the National Health Service would be wine, spirits and primary care. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm hoping that, that they adopt that uh, as a global because they're owned by Boots, right? You know, so it's theoretically they could take it to Glasgow. Be a big seller. <laughs> Lovely. Well, they are—they are the folks. They are the folks who say, right, when CVS, um, I think who was the medical director of CVS who got them to stop selling cigarettes? Uh, blank on his name, but the good guy. Oh, uh, uh, Troy Brennan. Troy Brennan. Troy Brennan. Yeah, yeah. he's still there, right? Um, no, and, no, he's he's. Yeah, a, yeah. Troy's left. Troy's left. Okay. He would, but he, I saw him talk about this, and uh, I somebody asked someone at Walgreens, you know, CVS has stopped selling cigarettes. Why are you still selling them? And the answer I got was, well, we're, we, we say that Walgreens is the corner of healthy and happy. And some people get happy by smoking cigarettes. Yeah. So they're the happy part. So, whoa. Well, anyway. All right, Michael, uh, you come from the, home, the hometown of Walgreens, don't you? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, uh, Walgreens is, uh, uh, like so many others, closing off half its headquarters building because people aren't coming to the office anymore. They're right there off the uh, uh, Tri-State Tollway. Um, corner of healthy and happy and in, in their stores, at least in this area, they have all these photos of old fashioned uh, drugstores. So you'll think that they're an old fashioned neighborhood drugstore as opposed to a multi-billion dollar uh, conglomerate that can't uh, 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 hire pharmacists fast enough to fulfill all their promises about uh, healthcare provision. Uh, but of course, I wish them nothing but success, just like those neighboring drug companies, AbbVie and Abbott, uh, uh, paragons of uh, price rising that the federal government penalized in the case of AbbVie. Um, I found myself wondering whether the penalty you pay for excess profiteering is anywhere close to the money you take in by doing the profiteering uh, and uh, how much of that penalty is tax deductible. But other, other than that, so the government this week did in fact start to penalize companies for raising the prices 
too high, which caused many farm executives to try very hard not to laugh in their face. Um, and uh, of course, the big story is chat GBT, which uh, is set to take over the world. Now that chat GBT4 is rolled out, uh, they apparently are working on a medical version of chat, chat GBT which keeps you waiting 15 minutes after an inquiry. Um, and uh, they're uh, also, sorry about that, Mike. And uh, they, uh, 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 Google has rolled out its own medical Q&A version that is calling something Palm with a capital L and M. And it is Med Palm. Yes, thank you. People th are either supposed to think it's a Palm Pilot or it's LLM with one L missing. I'm not, I'm not quite sure uh, which, but it it's a big deal. And so, um, you know, we're 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 doing a lot of things. And of course, uh, whether or not uh, Walgreens will sell a, a, an abortion drug, and what whether a totally objective uh, federal judge in Texas will rule on whether the government has uh, authority to, you know, be the government. Yeah, that, I expect we'll talk about that one a little bit <laughs> in both yeah. cases. Fantastic. All right. Um, yeah, and and, and uh, as you mentioned, Walgreens has been in the news a lot, and I think they lost that. We mentioned last week they lost that on the on the show. We, they they Gavin and, Gavin Newsom took away a contract because of their uh, reluctance to sell the drug, which none of us can pronounce. But it's, I, it's, I will it's, say I feel sympathetic to them. I mean, sort of damned if you do, damned if you yeah. don't. So it's pretty easy to to criticize them either way, but it, it, they're, they're not in a good spot. But, no, and it's very tricky in general to like figure out which companies, you know, well, how companies can respond to 50 different uh, regulation regimes. Although okay. to be fair, a lot of healthcare companies have got used to that over the years. And and, uh, and there's, there's obviously some very, very touchy subjects going on here. Now that's, okay, Mike, what have you been up to? What are you looking at? Well, like you said, Matthew, it's been a busy week. You know, the uh, BVP thing um, uh, that uh, everybody else has been watching. I've been looking at it from the standpoint of large nonprofits and philanthropists who are all tied up in this bank for some uh, particular reason, I guess mainly because of the tech venture capitalists are from the region and therefore those funders of the large nonprofits um, were all invested in there. But the people that I know here way on the East Coast were frantic at the end of last week because uh, their money was all tied up in that regional bank. So that was one thing. But the, the, the main thing I sort of have been uh, focused on is this myth Pristone uh, controversy. And it's interesting to me, you know, that um, where we're going with this, I mean, the trajectory of this is back toward birth control. I mean, that's the ultimate destination if you want to really take control over an entire gender. Uh, you got to go beyond abortion, which is a relatively small percentage, and you got to get like the good old Catholics did and in, involved with um, with birth control. And it's just interesting that uh, with the Plan B methodology now, surgical um, abortions are in the minority, and 53% in 2022 were medical abortions. So um it's not particularly surprising to me that while most of us would view this as a success, that the uber conservative uh, religious right view this as the failure. And uh, they're now want to kind of ride this uh, along the Federalist Society uh, railroad uh, right back into the 19th century. So we'll we'll see what happens, but um, a lot of people are getting caught in the middle of this. Uh, one of the former FDA associate commissioners, Mark Scheinstein, uh, was quoted uh, in Stat yesterday saying, "This is probably round one of a twelve-round boxing match. You want the court to decide what drugs are safe and effective? Well, good luck to all of us with that." And I think that's sort of where we're where we're at with this whole mess. But, but I mean, I think that the question, and, and we'll get to uh, Vince in a second, but just on this this topic, the question that you know that I most have seem to see is that if, even if this judge, as expected, right in, a, in Amarillo, Texas, and an extreme conservative judge, you know, where they, where they obviously the case was chosen, the, the the judge was chosen for <laughs> the. I'll rephrase this: the the, uh, the the pressure group chose the judge for the case. You know, and this goes. I don't know if the next stop up is that the local court, the the local district, sorry, the local. 
Federal Circuit Court, and then I assume it goes to the Supreme Court. You know, um, you can imagine, given the complexion of who's on the bench in those in those organizations, that that this could be. You know, you could go down this path. And don't forget, this drug is not just used for abortion, right? It's also used for yeah. things like you know, uh, women who are who have miscarried and but are unable to actually you know uh, actually to, to, to naturally um you know uh, uh remove the fetus and that's kind of like an in-between step before a dnc which is a you know a standard procedure and a lot of doctors now are not wanting to perform that because it's they're worried about being accused of, of of performing abortions in places like texas and florida and elsewhere so yeah this is this is this is really to those of us who are sort of scientific bent pretty incredible Michael, and then we haven't got the so, bits because you haven't got it on yet. Just with, real quickly, when, when I worked for the Tribune in the early 90s, Searle, which was then headed by uh, Don Rumsfeld of Republican White House fame, uh, w- was coming out with the Mr. Crystal, and they they ditched it. I Somebody read me the memos. Uh, they were pretty angry because, of course, his, of his uh, political um, uh, ambitions. And they would, they just decided not to come out with the drug. And one of the um, anti-abortion activists of the time, a uh, uh, Catholic priest who was very active, referred to the gas chambers of the Planned Parenthood. And that's that's kind of where the opponents are coming from. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously, and, and you know, goes back to Hobby Lobby and not wanting to pay for contraception and all the rest of that. You know, the, the, there are people who f- sort of fundamentally disagree with how most of society lives, and they've got a lot of power. Uh, Vince, how many can tell us about something cheerier or more interesting or <laughs> distract us at least? <laughs> I don't think it'll be very cheery. I'll, I'll just offer first before I, oh, I do want to discuss a little bit about Silicon Valley Bank, but I'll start with some of my own personal observations about the drug and pharmacist shortage. Uh, my, we used to go to our local Rite Aid, gone there for years, and uh, about a year ago, they started closing down for lunch, and then they were closing at five in the evening, and one day, they there was nobody there, and my wife needed something, uh, so we switched to mail order. Uh, I'll keep you posted over the couple of months. It's so far so good. You know, they, my wife tried it. They, they've showed up, CBS Caremark. Uh, maybe that's the solution. But I do want to talk about and raise some questions about what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. And, you know, two, so two major issues. One is sort of a, a diagnosis of what happened. And my take is this is very much a self-inflicted wound on the on the bank's part. You know, last Wednesday evening, they made two unrelated announcements that were both given in the spirit of transparency and uh, disclosure. One was that they had had to sell uh, some bonds uh, to cover. Uh, to, to cover the, uh, the outstanding loans and that they lost $1.8 billion, which for a bank that size is not that big a deal, frankly. And then they made a, a, an unrelated announcement that they were looking for an outside investment, I think of about two and a quarter billion dollars. So what happened was, you know, people picked up on that and assumed that they were related and uh, you know, a couple, several VCs started tweeting, and the next thing you know, there's a forty-two billion dollar run on on the bank uh, on Thursday, and and Friday they're gone. Uh, wow, I mean, this is just amazing. And uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of debating in my own mind whether you could call that a black swan event, you know, which is something that's supposed to be unanticipated, but so much of this was anticipatable that. You know, bond rates are going to uh, go down when interest rates go up, and they know that their their borrowers are, uh, you know, the venture is dried up in the valley, and fun, fun, you know, companies have been pulling out money from the bank because they just need liquidity. And then uh, the question I want to pose, you know, which isn't going to be answered today, is, you know, what is the impact of all this on digital health? Hmm. Uh, there were quite a few. Uh, 
the, the company SVB was really very active in funding a lot of digital health companies uh, inside and outside of the valley. And I think it's you know hard to see any kind of a good scenario coming out of this. Um, some of the for, for people who are curious, I think some of the best analysis is written by a uh, pitch book. They've got uh, oh, at least half a dozen different reports looking at this from different angles for anyone who wants to go a little bit deeper. But you know they they paint the picture that this could be you know it's one more dagger in what has already been a last year was a declining year in digital health investment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you know, it's hard to paint a picture that this is going to have any positive effects. They were very helpful to many early stage companies, you know, providing guidance, uh, you know, providing you know market insights and analysis, and all that's gone. All right. Yeah. So I mean, I think the Silicon Valley Bank thing. I, you know, we we can. Uh, it's also been talked about a lot. Uh, my underlying thing is, you know, you, you've got to be with. Jimmy Stewart trying to figure out that <laughs> the money's not really in the bank, right? It's in Mr. Smith's house down the corner and whatever, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for it's a wonderful life. That is, that is how banking works, right? So eventually they don't want their money at one time when they think there's a real run in the bank. You know, it happens and it's going to happen quicker today because of electronic banking and wires and they were backed up and some people put wires in that didn't get it. And social media that, that social amplifies media, like, yeah. the the fear. Well, I, saw the, I saw this at about noon. I actually... Uh, so one of the companies I'm involved in was uh, actually raising some money at the time, right? And the, they, they, they're one of the few people who were trying to wire into Silicon. They had an investor trying to wire money into Silicon Valley Bank at the time. I saw that on Twitter. I got the CEO and said, you better call them up and stop and actually, they actually stop the transaction in order to make sure that the money, you know, there were the few people putting money into the bank while the run was going on. So uh, they, they, they actually, you know, stopped that would have helped them. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I think that the bigger point, I mean, you know, a couple of things. One is there are a lot of financial instruments by which you can hedge against things going badly for you. So if they bought a bunch of bonds and mortgages, which would go down in value when when the interest rates go up, they could hedge against interest rates going up. And they seem to just haven't done this either properly or at all, or who knows. So, you know, they they clearly screwed up. They'd obviously taken many, many, they'd increased their asset base of, as venture went up dramatically over the last few years. You know, and their stock price had gone up, and they lobbied against being told, you know, against regulations. In fact, those regulations got weakened, and Silicon Valley Bank was one of the ones lobbying against lobby against those regulations, and they actually got got weak got weakened in 2018. Um, and then many of the staff, including the CEO, were doing maybe it's planned asset sales, but were selling stock, you know, all the way through this up until you know very recently, which we'll get, I'm sure, a harsh look at when this gets uh, gets examined. But in the end. I think for any you know corporation, small corporation, big business, whatever, you uh, individual, you've got to believe that money in the bank is money in the bank, right? And if that doesn't work, we we do go back to the nineteen thirties, you know, <laughs> whether it was uh, some. I, I saw uh, uh, an analyst, Justin Leonard, I think his name was a Australian guy who bizarrely used to be a tenant of mine, very very briefly in San Francisco in a house I was buying, and for a couple of weeks he was still there while I bought it. So I, I, I see him now and again. He was on, uh, he was on uh, NBC, M MSNBC or something, and you know, he was saying, "I don't think this was as woke. Uh, you know, this was because of the wokeness of the Silicon Valley Bank, the you know, diversity thing that they were talking about." Because remember the 1930s, <laughs> the whole country was run by white men, including the financial business, and we had a lot of run on the bank runs on the bank then, you know. But but it does seem to me that you know there will be a you know there's there's a, like an initial impact that you talk about, Vince, right? Because we have. We don't know how much venture debt there was and how much of that, you know, will stay there or when it will be called or what when they unwind their positions, how much of that will come back to some of these, you know, cash poor, uh, sort of revenue poor, but maybe cash rich, but not that cash rich, cash, cash rich uh, private companies and ask them for their money back. You don't know how that's going to play out. So that's one immediate impact. And the bigger impact is is just the concept of, of you know, um, this is just this, this is just another nail of the confidence that we may spend a few more years while Silicon Valley as a whole is not really happy to, you know, it's just another reason not to give venture-backed companies money. Um, and obviously venture-backed companies have been getting a lot less money and we have a lot to clear up in terms of companies that have IPO'd, gone public and are losing a ton of money and in digital health and elsewhere are seeing their, are seeing their market caps, you know, decimated 
I mean, some of them, yeah, some of the folks like Pear and Babylon and uh, and, and uh, Bright Health and others, you know, who are who are worth tens or hundreds of millions when they were worth, you know, billions a year and a half ago. Uh, a lot of that stuff has to be cleaned up before you can sort of start again. And we don't seem to be very fast, far far right ahead in that period. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. But that's my kind of Silicon Valley Bank thing. And although I did have one, uh, <clears throat> I'm a teeny teeny investor in one little syndicate. And I got an email from the CEO saying, oh, we have $5 million on <laughs> on deposit in <laughs> Silicon Valley Bank. I hope it's going to be OK. <laughs> Apparently it is. But anyway, anyway. Um, Ian, do you want to pundit on this quickly? Oh, no, no, it just, I mean, I, I, I thought the piece that Elizabeth Spears did in the New York Times uh, this morning, I guess, it came out, you know, about what was the title? I was an SVP client. I blame the venture capitalists. But it, it wasn't so much a, a, a black swan event as a black sheep event in her, uh, right. in her analysis. You know, they were all, uh, the VCs sort of herding effect. I was at dinner last night at, a golf club, which is, you know, pretty much all Silicon Valley elite. Um, and none of them seem to be hurting, I have to tell you. So, I I, I mean, I th- the people who are hurting probably are people who are on the stock in the bank as opposed to people who have deposits in the bank, given what's uh, been announced, right? Well, I mean, but, but that's okay. Right? It's not great if you're a stockholder. There was, <clears throat> there was somebody who went, I think you saw this, there's somebody who bought some put options on Wednesday afternoon. Bought seven thousand dollars worth of put options and took out a million and a half on Friday morning. <laughs> Interesting to find out who that that is and what they knew. But but you know it's it's okay to let the the stockholder wipe out songs. That you can stop that. It's not, having runs on the bank is you know that leads to the, to the Great Depression, right? Yeah, and I'm no expert in this, but I, I I noted either on Twitter or somewhere that there was an announcement that the the uh, the Justice Department was investigating this not not the the SEC or or you know financial regulators but whether there was malfeasance in terms of some of the communications on the run on the bank well and just unrelated and I'm being slated on Twitter at the moment for this that there was a report from uh a report from ProPublica this morning about insider trading they they got leaked a whole trove of IRS documentation like uh, 10 years worth which and they're going through it and they've, they've gone through it if you remember if you not remember they went through it for looking at how some billionaires you know how much tax some billionaires paid and stuff last year and it, 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 it was pretty shocking stuff but they uh didn't seem to have much much impact although it was connected to elizabeth warren and her wealth tax proposals but this morning's was about they were looking at um various you know wealthy individuals trading in the stock of competitors whether they understood or knew what was going on with competitors and how they'd had some incredibly lucky trades, you know, where the only trade they'd made in a competitor's stock happened to be immediately the day before the stock collapsed and they went out, you know, they shorted it or just before they, they had a good deal or whatever. So um seems 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 to me that, you know, that yes, this probably was leaked illegally from the uh, from the IRS and you know, a lot of people saying this is terrible that the, the ProPublic's reporting on it. But I mean, you know, lots of great stuff has come out lots of great journalism and investigations and you know corruption has uh, corruptions are exposed by stuff that's been leaked but you can imagine that uh that some of the insider trading that's gone on you know in the silicon valley bank whether it was accelerated planned sales because they knew things were going to be coming coming due over the next year or, or you know whether it was actual genuine insider trading but wouldn't surprise you if there's there's more that to come out because usually you know it's like well, they say like cockroaches, there's not just one of them. There's a ton going on. And and uh, uh but it is very important that we can make sure this the banking, the banking, you know, that all of our money in the bank is money in the bank. Because I mean, if you can't trust that, then you have to take it out, put it under your couch, and you know, buy bulk gold bullion or whatever. So Vince, can I ask you a question? I thought you said some some really interesting things about the expertise there. Since the bank, since the the, the federal government stepped in and the bank was sort of quote unquote, saved in a certain way. Do you think that the employees were sort of the people who gave the advice, I mean, the, the middle level expertise as opposed to the CEO, do you think that will be preserved at all? That 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 some of some of the ability to serve as guidance, even though people will be chosen that some of the expertise that provides guidance to uh, companies will be preserved. So I'll, I'll share a conversation I had with a, a digital health CEO who actually banks at uh, 
uh, or banked at SVB. And what he told me, uh, you know, the, the FDIC wants to preserve, I mean, they got to keep the bank running. And right. he took money out and on Monday and he said the transaction went through. So he presumes that the IT department is still there. Uh, he, I, I, what he explained to me was, is that what the FDIC is doing is offering existing employees, because their stock is now wiped out, what the FDIC is fearful of is everyone just on Monday morning just leaves and doesn't show up. So they've offered people, he quoted, 1.5 times their existing salary to show up on Monday. And uh, apparently it's been working. So, uh, you know, I I don't know. I think mean, we could look at that as an interim measure. I think a lot of the the value added services that the company would have been offering to, to digital health type of companies, you know, are probably, I'm, I'm guesstimating, are probably not going to be able to be continued. But there's some infrastructure there. There's some people there. What does it look like six months from now? I think it's going to look very different. And, you know, I, I presume the feds are going to try and sell the bank to somebody. We'll have to see who that is. But you're, you're, I mean, you're raising an excellent question, Michael. Like what, you know, what, what happens to that infrastructure? And I think they're trying to preserve it, which is wise. Yeah, and I think they, they have to. There's also a, there's an there's an analysis investment analysis part of the bank, which you know is, it will probably get sold to somebody else. And then there's uh, the other interesting thing: the bank, you know, a lot of this stuff. They've been, you know, where they've been working with these companies, they also have a lot of venture debt. They probably have a bunch of warrants and other stuff on you know, uh, options on the upside. So th it's probably, you know, one of these things. And, and eventually a lot of the stuff they bought, the mortgages and whatever, will come back to par over time because <laughs> they will get redeemed at some point eventually, unless things are going to go, you know, unless the economy is going completely a little haywire. So you could imagine, I'm sure some bank will, bigger, bigger financial institution will end up acquiring the guts of it and taking over a lot of those, you know, sifting through that. And if you remember the top thing back in 2009 through 2014 or whatever, actually made the U.S. government a profit, right? All those bad banks they took over, they actually in bond yeah. stuff, they actually got out, you know, we, are, the, we the taxpayer got out whole. So, uh, you know, assuming things are going to be okay in the long distant, long term future, I think it's probably an, an interesting play. But it, 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 it's very scary that you can have, you know, a run, a run on the bank. FDIC, you know, um, FDIC, uh, uh, guarantee is only at the 250. There are a number of sort of fintech institutions. There's one called Mercury Bank, which um, has, has now has, has managed to figure out a way to make FDIC insured accounts of like a million or a million and a half. And there's a, a brand new fintech organization called uh, Meow, which is, doesn't sound a very sensible old bank name. And Meow, which which will give you, and they will make you a lot of fuss over the weekend. They will get you both an interest paying. Two fifty thousand account and an automatic way that all the rest of the money goes into one day and ten day treasury bills and bonds, so it pays those rates, but then gets back automatically. And Meow is just a front end. There's an actual real bank with the two fifty, and then I think Mellon Bank or somebody is managing the uh, is managing the treasury bills. So I think there'll be a lot of changes in how how companies think about this stuff. But it's it's certainly something that you know none of the startups who raised those hundreds, hundreds of millions ever really thought about how they're managing that money, right? They stuck it in the bank. Yes, couple, fast couple, and, uh, couple, <laughs> no one thought couple, this was coming down that way. Well, there doesn't seem to be uh, any end to the learning uh, curve on this whole thing. I don't know whether you guys picked it up this week, but there was a very interesting debate between David Faber on CNBC and Elizabeth Warren, uh, in which David was trying against all odds to make the argument that we really don't need more regulation. And of course, Elizabeth Warren was saying, come on. But anyhow, Elizabeth Warren at one point, she says, you know, David, for years I was a teacher. And one thing I learned as a teacher is that you can't allow the students to test themselves. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, you know, at that point, Faber just sort of threw up his hands and said, okay, I give. <laughs> Some of this is just like common sense that, yeah. you know, uh, uh, you need regulation because if you don't have regulation and checks and balances, human beings misbehave. It's, you know, it's part of our nature. Absolutely. Some of what I've been reading also is that uh, the, the, the regulations were relaxed in 2018 
right. uh, where uh, banks, different thresholds of uh, stress testing was done for banks over 50 billion, it was raised to 250 billion, which Silicon Valley Bank would have been under. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, there's multiple causes here. The, the taxpayers, though, Matthew, Matthew, if you read the announcement from the Fed, are not the ones on the hook. They're going to make an assessment to other banks. And I mean, I guess you can argue that's going to wind up coming back to us, but at least it's not coming out of directly taxpayers' money. I'm sure. But, I'm sure Chase can, can't can't wait for an excuse to charge me another twelve bucks a month on any of my own accounts when when I go a you know a penny below with five grand in average fee, average balance or whatever it is, <laughs> one day in the month. You know, you're saying, I get it, you know, you know? <laughs> one way to characterize this is what the Feds are doing is sort of giving a payday loan, a very large one. <laughs> It's, it's it's actually kind of interesting. I was looking at some of the, there was a uh, uh, there's been a I'm blanking on who wrote this or where I read it, but somebody I think it might have been David K Johnson um, in DC Report. But the fees that banks charge fall predominantly on people who don't have high balances in the you know on poor people. Uh, it's remark a, a very high proportion of the, sort of the, the banking fees get paid by people who are essentially low income so <laughs> maybe the fight that the, the fact is that yes the silicon valley in the end the silicon valley bank you know rich venture capital backed uh startups will be having their <laughs> having their feet you know the charge will come back to the poor the poor suckers who bank at chase and bank of america and you know can't keep the minimums in their account to get charged with 10 bucks a month which yeah no it, it's, oh, yeah. it's hard. It's what the casinos used to call low rollers, right. the, the the most profitable segment, right? Because you don't give away anything to them and they lose all their money. Um, <laughs> but I, mean, I think Vince started with the right question. I'd be, you know, be interested. Maybe Matthew, you can write the definitive piece, which is what are the knock on consequences for health and digital health in particular of this debacle? Um, and I mean, I one angle might be. I'm, I'm an advisor to uh, Concord Health Partners, which is doing running the AHA's innovation fund and a bunch of limited partners inv investing in health uh, stuff. But it may have a chilling effect on, you know, because a lot of these rounds that have been uh, funded have been funded with the health systems money. It may have a chilling effect on the, on the typical board's uh, risk profile, you know, of saying, geez, uh, the CEO sold us this idea, put a couple of million in, in startups. Um, maybe we will look twice at that. Yeah, I don't, I, 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 but but I, I think Vince is posing the right question, which is what are the knock-on effects for the ecosystem, particularly the digital health ecosystem? Yeah, we'll I, mean, I, I, I just I just add to that, it's not happening in the vacuum, right? We're already seeing, you know, those rounds collapsing because the public the public markets collapsed, the private market collapsed, right? Um you know, uh, the private market is the number. There are still investments. There's, you know, Google Ventures put money in a company called First Hand in Mental Health and put, I think, 30, 40 million in the, the other, day, other day. They're still going on. Sorry, Anya, go on. Well, no, no, I, I didn't mean to try. I just have uh, one additional example I'd like to put on the table because I'd like uh, Mike and Vince to, to weigh in on it, which I think is, re is a related example um, of the emergency room physicians uh, emergency medicine match, uh, residency match came out the other day, and it there were 555 unfilled slots wow. out, of, out of like 2,500, um, which is double over last year. And now they think that in uh, they think the supplementary match will uh, eventually fill those slots. So it's not we're not going to train them, but it's sort of a chilling effect in the industry. And some people have been uh arguing about why that happened i think this is an example that there's going to be similar things from the silicon valley bank stuff because i think part of the driver is not just covid and and the pressures and stresses of being an er doc in the last couple of years but it's also because of the the collapse of uh a surprise billing because half of these guys were employed by enterprises who were predicated on shenanigans and the finances may be going sideways so i i don't know I, I, all of you are more expert than i than in, in that area but i but i think that's another example of the sort of knock-on effects that you can have when you have this kind of business failure 
Yeah, and I think yeah, there's, I think. there's I mean, a lot of things are swirling, right? And 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 one is digital health companies are struggling to get revenues out of the current system. The current the current incumbents are all. If you look at the hospital, if Jeff Goldsmith was here, he'd be crying how you know hospitals are all losing money. And you know, we'll, we'll, I'd love to hear more from you, Ian, about about the sort of how how the 150 CEOs you were talking to uh, to about that. And that and and it's and and yet it's hard to get what's been happening in the last sort of uh, couple of years or four or five years is but either that you know outside actors have come into primary care and you see this with cbs buying oak street and all the rest of it or venture cap venture back companies are trying to build their own health systems right including hiring their own doctors and building you know uh asthma clinics or <laughs> online mental health clinics or online gi clinics or whatever they are they are you know and then eventually going to bricks and mortar as, as well and um, it, while they're struggling, it's hard to know, you know, if the, those digital health companies are starting to struggle, people selling to them are starting to struggle, and therefore, you know, there's no real obvious market to go and sell to to the incumbents. I think it does put the whole sort of health tech, health IT ecosystem into a into a fair amount of a fair amount of trouble. And you know, this, this is just one more part of it. Anyway, yeah, I, I think I that's absolutely to, true. Go to Mike, and then I'd love to go back to Ian about his hospital CEOs. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, whether whether it's uh, SVP or, or whether it's emergency room docs, I think it's important to realize that these kind of um, uh, little rumblings and their little and their rumblings compared to the overall issue within uh, the structures of both the finance industry and the healthcare industry and where they intersect with each other. For example, the... The ER doc crisis uh, is already well underway, and it's trying to be addressed by using other types of providers in these settings and basically loading up on the number of non-physician staff within the space. So if you get stuck in an ER these days in anything from a small city to a large city, you're going to encounter tons of people who don't look like they're doing that much because they're waiting in these very kind of complex process chains to get things done because there is no physician there. You know, they're working around the fact that they've lost so many physicians. And I, th and I expect that, Ian, that the market over a period of a couple of years will self-correct by raising the benefit of being an ER doctor. But if not, they'll raise it, the benefit of being an ER uh, nurse practitioner or an ERPA and do it that way. Um, but in any case, for the patient, I don't think it's a very satisfactory result, not because there are fewer doctors, but because these locations where you're already coming in stressed to the max, right? You know, I know. And yet you have the sense when you get stuck in the middle of it, that it's kind of a little bit out of control, which is, is not a good feeling if you've got chest pain and your EKG is abnormal, or right. if you had a fresh stroke or, or whatever, you want things to be kind of calm and, and under control. And it doesn't feel that way. Yeah, and I mean, just I, I mean, one of the highlights from the my meetings with with all the all the hospital CEOs is particularly academic medical centers. They're all full, and their yeah. ERs are full to overflowing. To yep. to Mike's point, and um, you you know the 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 hospitals are blocked, uh, you know, with bed blockers because they can't place them anywhere because of the collapse yep. of skilled nursing facility staffing, and the bottom line is. Yeah, Jeff's comments from previous weeks are right on. I mean, 60% are losing money. Uh, now, it's very uneven. It depends on your geography and your peer mix. Some people are making 5% uh, operating margins even more, um, but that they're few and far between. Most people are sucking the air. And it's all labor costs, and it's all it, – it is starting to ameliorate a little bit. The traveler's rates are – you know, drop from 300 down to 100 and 150, depending on which market, but not for specialties like pediatric uh, um, ICU, uh, NICU type uh, nurses, very hard to get. Um, but, but you know, these guys are trying to work through it. They're, they're, I was sort of impressed by a lot of the innovation on 
workforce stuff and and you know they're they're rolling up their sleeves i think what you're going to see though is less shiny object coming back to the digital health thing and more operational excellence that yeah. they're going to have to knuckle down on i mean that was one of the messages from the meeting that um you, you know a real renewed vigor on cost containment and and efficiency and on throughput i uh, ken kaufman and i did a fireside chat it was like we were like the two old guys in the Muppets. I, I look, I made the mistake of looking down on the screen and these bald guys nodding away. Um, it was pretty bad. Uh, but but you know, I mean, Ken's he he told some great stories about trying to get a GI appointment. Um, I've got a dermatology appointment, it's in the second term of the Chelsea Clinton administration, you know. <laughs> you think that's bad. So we're talking about ER rooms. I was on the line with uh, uh Tortilla uh, uh colleague of mine who's an American who lives in the UK been there for 20 years so the inverse of me and Ian and uh, she was she's just had a kid and she was complaining that uh, and there's been a lot of fuss in the UK about incredibly long waits for emergency rooms you know 12 hours whatever okay. and it's underfunded and she was saying she was going to think of moving back to the states because she's just had a kid and it's taking her she uh, her kid has a rash and in order to send the photo she needs to get an appointment that's like several weeks in the future to send a photo of the, you know, kid's diaper rash, whatever it is, <laughs> and get that read. And I was saying, you know, I was saying, you shouldn't move to the, the you know, don't move to the, if you, if you want to go and get, you know, see a doctor straight away, just move to France. <laughs> Much quicker and easier to move to America. But anyway, I shouldn't like the French people very much. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think the interesting, you know, I, I, I talked to a startup this week that hasn't launched yet, but will soon, but they, without telling exactly what they're doing, they are going to be in the business of selling kind of care management services, the stuff to wrap around, which is you might call the shiny objects, to fever service hospitals. And they've sold one already. They've got a big con couple of contracts which are coming out. They'll This will be out of stealth in a couple of weeks. And I can, I can tell you it's an interesting play, but their argument is that they will enable, you know, better, faster throughput by remote monitoring and all the other stuff that will help fever service systems, you know, get get the GI appointment this week or the dermatology appointment before the Chelsea Clinton administration. Is that before or after the Ivanka Trump administration? I don't uh, know. Uh, but a long way out. A long it. way out. But I mean, you know, I wonder if you, 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 can, you can make the argument that if you could do more effective technology and manage patients better and know where they are and get the get the bed blockers out of there and you know have, have them at home being monitored and whatever you can do that you can get more throughput and actually make you know fever service, fever service systems more money while we're all waiting around for you know the magic of of, of managed care and you know um, hospital home all that stuff to happen i don't know the, 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 well but i think, well, Matt, I, think you're, I, I, I mean when i was in the stanford for my surgery i mean i i kept thinking if if we applied the kind of innovation and system design that a lot of the digital world is doing on the front end to the bit where the money is, which is the complex stuff, yeah. we'd be much better off. Because I, I just don't buy the, we do primary care better, we eliminate hospitalizations. We, we've already got the lowest hospital use in the world. I mean, what? come on. As how much lower is it going to get? It's why Bob Margolis rather have Medicare Advantage than commercial uh, business because there's not much leeway, there's not much saving there. But but the excessive use of resources, you know, once you get sick is just mammoth. And I, you know, I started my healthcare career as a management engineer, even though I wasn't qualified for it. Um, last time we were at Mayo and Nora and I, they, it was like they had two hundred people in management engineering. Um, you know, we need that kind of dedication to redesign uh, with the kind of innovation that digital health and the Silicon Valley crowd can bring. I, I mean, I think that's, I think we've got our priorities the wrong way around. Michael, should I mute and then come and talk, talk to us about it? Michael, you have to unmute first. When they went to prospective payment, we can remember back that part, right? That was supposed to make the hospitals efficient, right? And all of us have seen over the years, they do a little bit of efficiency and they find a way to get around whatever regulations there are and make oodles of money, right? And even before COVID, you know, right now it is, it is a terrible time for many hospitals, absolutely. But if you go back 
to just before COVID, uh, they were uh, shoveling money as if they were oil companies, right? And, and um, you know, so they, they cry poor, but they have never in good times tried to be serious about being efficient. I mean, all of us know that if you go and say, okay, this surgery, what does it cost you and what's your margin, right? What are the outcomes of your different, uh, of your different physicians? Who's cost effective? Who's clinically effective? The kind of basic questions you would ask of anybody who's running an operation, the answer is this guy brings in a lot of patients. He has a lot of billable uh, time and RVUs to uh, commercial payers, and we make a lot of money off of this particular surgeon. That's their answer. And then when things go bad, like, oh, my God, give us more money. And they just have not been managers. We've seen this over year after year after year after year, right? So um, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, they need some encouragement to be efficient as well as uh, just, you know, add more. And, and certainly, you know, when COVID came, even the people who had lots of reserves, what do you do? You lay off a bunch of staff, right? You're a nonprofit, but you lay off all the people answering the phone. Uh, and uh, then people can't get appointments because you can't bring them all back. Uh, I will just add one thing on dermatology. I tried to get a routine dermatology appointment through my health system. And I called them up and they went out three years and they said, we're, we're only allowed to go out three years and we don't have anything for you with, with, <laughs> with, a, straight, with a straight face. So, uh, so much for preventive care. Uh, well, so you're doing worse than the baby in the UK. Uh, <laughs> but it's for, for, for your rash, but uh, I... Well, yes. oh, well, they did. I, I have to say, so this is sort of on, on the preventive care thing. I got a notice a, a few weeks ago uh, that uh, my uh, health system had put me in an ACO. Uh, and Ooh. my being one of the few people actually knows what an ACO is, right? So I went to the, uh, you know, they, they have something they send you that CMS makes them send, which doesn't explain anything. So, all right, well, that, that's interesting. So I decided, I said, I didn't even know this health system had a, a, an ACO. So I Googled the ACO uh, that my health system had because I had this idea of seeing, is my doctor group in it? And I also had this uncharitable impulse of saying, I wonder if they put in patients who live in certain zip codes who are more affluent, as opposed to people who don't live in other zip codes. How do they decide who is in the ACO? Well, you couldn't find anything. The list of people that chat, chat, so there was no, nothing at all. And then I looked at the ACO. Well, I said, well, this is good. I'll be able to find out how well they perform, right? So I looked at the ACO uh, performance data, which, which they had as required by law. And then I realized, wait a second, since this doesn't tell me how many people are in the ACO or where they are, I can't compare, you know, Northwestern and North Shore or Advocate or Rush because I don't know whether one ACO is people in the city and the others in the suburbs or who they are. So I have no apples or apples that I could I could compare. And then I looked to see whether or not they had a patient representative. I didn't see it at first. So I volunteered to be the patient representative and they didn't write me back. Turns out it's some woman who's a... Uh, I don't know, her kid was saved by the hospital and she's a volunteer handing out brochures to people. She's the ACO patient representative. And, and finally I had a realization, which, you know, I'm a little slow because rather than thinking like a normal person, I've been thinking like a health policy person. <laughs> so wait a second. If they wanted to tell me the performance of my medical group, they could, all of them could because they have 100% of their patients, right? And so they could like this, this uh, uh, HMO in Michigan did at one point, they put out for each doctor for you know breast cancer screening, little apples, like one to four apples. And they told you how many apples your doctor got and what percentage they were compared to other doctors in the network, right? So you can see your this primary care doctor was 77%, this was 90%. And so I realized that, they could all do this if they wanted to. And why don't they do it? Why don't they tell us their patients how well they're doing? Because of course they want their doctors to be a commodity. If they don't want you to be loyal to the doctor, they want you to be loyal to Happy Valley Health System. And they don't want you comparing primary care doctors, which aren't very profitable. They want to have TV ads that say, we can give you a transplant or we can give you heart care. And so this is a nice little game where the CMS 
transparency measures mean nothing. The patient representative means nothing. And there's no comparative information. But, but, but I'll wait for my ACO to write me back. I'm sure, I'm sure it just must have gotten lost in the email. <laughs> your, your, uh, your, your dermatology story reminds me of a joke, um, Michael. This, this woman in Russia calls up the plumber and she says, you know, uh, I got a leak. When can you come? And the plumber says, uh, I've got an opening uh, 10 years out. And the woman says, morning or afternoon? And, and the plumber <laughs> says, what, what difference does it make? And she says, the electrician's coming in the morning. <laughs> Good. Well, I do know that if you Google ACO, at one point, if you Google ACO, you've got the American Cornhole Association. <laughs> so organization. American Cornhole Organization, right? So, well, Vincent Ian, you probably remember uh, back when Don Berwick was uh, first giving his uh, total quality management seminars on weekends in Boston. And back in 88, um, as a kid, I uh, went to one of those with the CEOs of the first hospital uh, that I worked at. And um, the thing that's stuck in my mind, even to this day, is he asked now, how many steps it, uh, does it take to treat someone who comes to the emergency room uh, with urinary sepsis? And the answer turned out to be 13 steps. And he said, now, who do you think is responsible for those 13 steps? And of course, everybody said the doctor and nurse. The doctor was responsible for one and the nurse was responsible for four. And wow. this was Don's way of saying the trick to all of this is simplification. You got to eliminate as many steps as you possibly can. Somehow in the last decade or so, we kind of forgot that and figured you could just keep multiplying these steps and there wouldn't be an impact and you could make up for staff shortages by adding more steps. But I think Don was probably basically right on two, two levels. Number one, it makes for a calmer and probably more efficient experience, but as important, it's easier to coordinate and manage that from a general care standpoint. Like I don't really care anymore whether I have this smart old internist managing my overall care. I'm just fine with the young woman PA who just came out as long as I can see her on the day that I call. And as long as when I sit there, she asks me what's going on. I tell her in a few sentences and she says, you're right. Let's go ahead and order that scan. And right in town, I can get that scan that day. So to me, part of the problem is already solved. Between Quest and the various different radiologic entrepreneurs, you can get those tests most of the time now, same day, and a report online in MySpace or whatever. And the other piece, I feel like these hospital systems have kind of figured out, we need this last piece in place accessible, not too complicated, uh, so that our people are going to be happy being cared for. The specialists are all out there. Um, you, you know, you may have to pull strings, but once you've got a rheumatologist, they tend to say, now I'm your rheumatologist. So if you've collected five or six of these specialists, really what the missing piece is, is just an accommodating generalist of some sort. <laughs> And so that's sort of what I think we need to focus on, fewer steps and accommodating generalists. Well said. Yeah, no, that, that, is, that is well said. And I think it's it's honestly one of those issues is that, is that, you know, there's a problem here because there are a lot of people who don't have generalists, right? And, and I, I read some data. And again, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting to the, uh, the senior moment where I can't remember who, Whose, uh, whose service was just something like 25% of the people who had care in the last year didn't go to a generalist, didn't have a general practitioner, didn't go to right. with a And actually, it's the same number in Canada, too. Yeah. I mean, they have a tremendous oh, shortage. Really? How, yeah. how, so in Canada, can you get to a specialist without a generalist preferring? No, you? they you don't. Really because the trick there, what they do is you can go, you can self-refer to a specialist, but they won't see you because they'll be paid a primary care rate without a consult. 
it's a genius use of fee for service. So, but perhaps, that, uh, that's where the bottleneck. My my sister, I just talked to her yesterday. She got a cardiology consult just routinely, and uh, it's like weeks and weeks out. But because you can't go direct. Yeah, I mean, we're still uh, slicing stuff up here, and and you're still seeing all these. I mean, uh, whether they're specialists or, or digital health companies playing at being, you know, specialty clinics where people are, are just looking after one, you know, one body organ or one disease state or whatever it is. Um, you know, and, and people are, are referring into them directly. But I mean, uh, we still have the issue. You know, uh, the, my, my my consistent whines are yes, one is you can't get you can't get access to to to, to Adderall anywhere. <laughs> Currently fighting with CVS. My next call after this show is to call the CVS to show them that no, I really didn't have you know five different prescriptions right all running at the same time. Honestly, <laughs> um, but the but the other one is that you know primary care doesn't link in well to all these specialists. So Mike says you have to get these accommodations. But you know when I had a weird thing with my eye, and even at one medical, I said okay, you know get me to an ophthalmologist, and they went. Who's your ophthalmologist? And I went, well, I haven't got an ophthalmologist. <laughs> we're we're kind of, we were kind of hoping both. you may have one. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping that you'd know one, but we're not, we're both looking in the yellow pages to try and figure out all. Right. So, uh, yeah, do, it, do they have a referral network, Matthew? Do they, do they want really, that? No, no, not really. They're, it's they're, discharged they're, to the ether. It's, dis it's discharged to the ether, even though it's a fancy so, problem. So, which, which is, to be fair, you know, the, the problem is compared to, you know, a fever service primary care group, which looks after generally healthy people, which is what medical right. says, right. compared right. to like an IORA or an Oak Street where they are trying to stop people getting to expensive specialists and therefore they are trying to coach them out of it and you know, manage the specialists they're going to. Like, know, like, the Kaiser it, thing. like Matthew, our friend at Health 2.0 so many years ago, did everything, you know, remotely out of Brooklyn with uh, young people who were healthy. Jay Parkinson worked very well, and he's he's now re, he's now in his third reinvention of primary care. But I mean, what he what he did was was um, way off topic. Now, what he did was very clever, right? Which is he he built the second iteration was to build a completely online thing. Right, he sold the crossover health and crossover. They bought the Amazon clinics and some other stuff that, right. that they're working on, and they basically didn't have an, the online piece. And I, and, I, and I've been you know I won't bore you lot with it, but you've seen my bullshit about the uh, my. My, my slide about the continuous clinic and how we need to get everyone taken care of. But the, the point is, you know, it, there is more need, as Ian said, to use technology and remote staff and whatever to take care of people who are sick than there is to take care of people who are basically healthy, even if you, you know, so you, so, and the problem, a lot of the problem with digital health, a lot of it was aimed at people are too healthy. I think over the last five, 10 years, the last decade, half a decade, at least, there's been a lot more focus on how do you, how do you manage the, uh, the very sick, but you know, it 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 it's 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 tricky uh, because you know even if you have even if you have that, you've still got you know the old way it's always been done. And as Ian said, we haven't had the sort of property to figure out how to manage people who are who are who are who are very sick and in post acute, and you know. And then the other thing is, you can't save a lot of money if you're spending thousands of dollars a month on expensive biologic drugs you know <laughs> may, may keep people healthy but uh, you know, we haven't, there are parts of the equation we haven't figured out all right end of that rant um okay we're at the end of our hour and have we got that because we were supposed to be discussing uh texas judges and uh, um <laughs> uh, anti-abortion drugs we didn't really get very far on that but uh, <laughs> other stuff but uh, we're at the end of an hour so uh, let's have a quick go around and see what people are thinking of for the next uh, week or two so uh why don't I start with you, Vince? I'll I'll end where I started and be brief. I'm going to keep my ear to the ground and look for kind of the second, third order events from Silicon Valley Bank and how that affects digital health. I think there's going to be a lot going on there. Shoes to drop. <laughs> Mike? Well, uh, I uh, had a conversation this week uh, with a old colleague, uh, who is deeply enmeshed still in the pharma government relations kind of world. And the quote that he gave me, which kind of stuck in my head, was that one of his colleagues said, we want to be careful that we don't end up the wedge in a splintering GOP. And what he was referring to is that there's very little wiggle room 
left on some of these issues. On the one hand, if you defend the rights of the FDA to approve a drug, and that gives you a certain amount of protection over the lifespan of that drug, but in the process, you offend the uh, conservative Christians who happen to overlap with the uh, free marketers, uh, you're screwed. So basically, they're coming to a come to Jesus moment. They're going to have to choose sides pretty soon. And uh, without the FDA approval, they basically got nothing. So I think they're going to have to come down in support of the FDA. They'll try to stay quiet, but eventually they're going to come out into the open. Hmm. It's an interesting one. Michael. Well, first, I want to thank Dr. Mike McGee for solving the entire healthcare distribution problem in just under a minute. Uh, with, uh, <laughs> primary care. I wish I could do it for myself. I, I know you'll take a clip of this, Matthew, and send it to the to the appropriate committee chairs in Congress, perhaps the AMA, <laughs> and uh, that'll be that. So I I, I certainly appreciate it, Mike. Um, yep. And um, I, I think you know I'm still looking at. Uh, I spent a lot of this week talking about how AI and medicine is already here. Uh, I'm going to be posting something uh, uh, soon on, on that. And that when you take a look at cancer, for instance, you look at the kinds of things that are available, uh, even without chat GPT, there's a lot happening. And so, um, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, we are going to see a swelling impact of, of chat uh, GPT type AI and other AI on medical care, uh, that's going to go way beyond what some of the physicians are uh, are thinking about now, and is really going to affect the doctor-patient relationship uh, much more profoundly than any of the physician commentators I've seen uh, are, are commenting. Yeah, and that's fascinating. That Chat GPT stuff. Uh, Reed Hoffman of LinkedIn, the famous, just written a book with Chat GPT four. Probably the first book that was going to took less to read than it, <laughs> less time to read than it took to, than, than, than it will take to sorry less time to to write than it will be to read. Um, wow! Talking talk about Reid Hoffman, I was at a party uh, Stanford once when when I'm just after uh, uh, just after just after sort of the dot com boom, and he was in the corner talking about this thing. I didn't understand what the hell he was talking about, but it was PayPal. <laughs> so I should probably pay more attention anyway. <laughs> no, um, all right, Ian, last word. Um, well, selfishly, I'd be looking at First Republic and Charles Schwab solvency. Um, I, I'm not really affected by Silicon Valley Bank. But um, the, the one that we didn't get to, I, I had in my list, was the, the recent Kaiser Family Foundation a piece on, on charitable contributions of hospitals. And um, I, I tweeted uh, Larry Levitt just to... Uh, make the point that the reason one of the reasons why they're so low is because the uninsured is so low uh, and that's about to reverse big time with the public health emergency ending so i actually have a client conversation on monday with uh, a client try i i think we need to redefine community benefit and jeff goldsmith and i did a piece about a year ago on the blog that kind of got at it a little bit but but i think it's a a, a real concern because one of the issues that came out of this hospital meeting is hospitals are feeling under, you know, as, as one CEO put it, it, we've gone from heroes to zeros uh, and they, they know they're under the gun. Um, and I think it's partly because they haven't done a very good job of explaining uh, what they're doing. And some of them have, are not doing the right things. I mean, to be fair, but uh, most of them are, I think. And and that, that to, so I'll be focused on that in the next week or so. All right. Fantastic. Well, that is the, end of THCB gang for this week uh this is episode 120 you've been listening to ian morrison from the wilds of menlo park mike mcgee from the uh, cozy uh probably frigid shores of connecticut michael Wilson from the freezing but soon to be uh, baking plains of chicago and vince caritas from the uh the wilds of idaho um i'm matthew holt saying thank you very much for uh sticking around listening to this whether you're listening live uh, watching later on the video or listening to the podcast, which you can find on Apple or Spotify. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Um, we'll have another different gang discussing whatever the hell happened in healthcare over the pre preceding seven days or around that kind of time. Thanks and goodbye for now. <laughs>